Hi, my name is Amy. I'm going to be your nurse today. I'm just going to do a general head to toe assessment on you. Um, since we're admitting you to the hospital, so we just kind of want to see what's going on in every body system that you have. Is that, does that sound okay to you? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go wash my hands and put on some gloves. <laughs> Could you, I'm just going to ask you a couple questions. Could you um, tell me your name, please, first and last? Uh, Taylor Nehemiah. Good. And what year is it? Uh, 2020. Good. Good job. And then um, where are we at right now? Uh, Missouri Southern Skills Lab. Yeah, good job. All right, so that is just testing her um, level of consciousness to make sure she's alert and oriented. Um, now I'm going to, I would get, go ahead and get her vital signs. So Taylor, I'm just going to take your um, blood pressure, um, respirations, oxygen saturation, pulse, and um, temperature. So normal temperature is 97.4 to 99. Our normal pulse is 60 to 100. Um, respirations is 12 to 20. Oxygen sat, you would want above 20, um, 95%. And then blood pressure, um, the normal is 120 over 80. So after I get her vital signs, um, Taylor, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and go to the bathroom and empty your bladder and bowels for me um, as she's walking. I would watch her gait and posture just to make sure um, if she's shuffling, she might have um, Parkinson's, um, kind of slumped and walking slow, it could be depression. If her guarding the shoulder, it could be a shoulder dislocation or even a limp, you would notice too. Um, if you needed a specimen, like a urine specimen or a stool specimen, you would make sure to let the patient know that and um, gather those specimens after they come back from the bathroom. So. Now that she's back, I'm going to have her sitting facing me, and I'm just going to go ahead and kind of examine her overall um, appearance and symmetry. So looking at her head, it's positioned fine on her body, um, her shoulders are symmetric, and now I'm going to go in and feel her scalp. So, well first I would, in, after like inspecting the scalp and everything for um, brittle hair, and just noticing her hair distribution. Sometimes patchy losses could indicate like a fungal infection. Um, tinea capitis of, is a fungal infection of the head. So I'm gonna palpate, again, for any lumps or bumps, um, patches, uh, scaling, or even like cuts in the head. And then you kind of feel the hair and see how fine it is or if it's super coarse or not. Um, again, thin, brittle hair could be a environment deficiency. So after feeling her hair and making sure there's even distribution and everything, I'm going to go ahead and go down to her um, face and I'm just going to um, inspect the general symmetry of it. Her eyes are symmetric and then I'm going to palpate her sinuses. So Taylor, could you take your mask off for me? Thanks. So I'm going to palpate her sinuses, the frontal and the maxillary sinuses, to see if there's any pain. Any pain when I do that? No. Okay. If there was pain there, she might have like inflammation in um, her sinuses. So now I'm going to look at her eyes. So first I would just inspect the eyes, kind of see, make sure they're symmetric, um, make sure she doesn't have like one eyelid like drooping or anything like that, and then I would look at the um, sclera of her eyes. The color could tell you a lot, such as if there was um, yellowing of the whole sclera um, up to the pupil, that could indicate jaundice, which would indicate liver problems. Um, and then I would also check and see the um, conjunctiva, which I'll go ahead and pull down and you're looking for the color of that. Good. In the conjunctiva, you would look for um, bright redness, which could indicate inflammation or other um, what is known as pink eye or conjunctivitis. So after I inspect her eyes, I'm going to go ahead and take my pen light and I'm going to um, assess for Perla. So first, I'm just going to put my hand on the bridge of her nose and shine my light in her pupil, in one pupil, and I'm looking to make sure it constricts and the other one also constricts. Just look at my nose for me. Good, so she does have that um, 
consensual constriction, so both of them constrict at the same time. And then I would also be looking and measuring the um, size of her pupil. So hers are about three millimeters, which is the normal size of a pupil. So after I do that, I'm going to test for accommodation. So I'm going to have her look at the tip of my pen light and then look at the wall. Good. And what you're looking for there is to make sure the eye accommodates for trying to see further away so the uh, pupil's eye will actually dilate and hers does. Um, any of these could, if they weren't normal, could indicate like a neurological deficiency um, or problem. So if she had one pupil that was dilated and fixed, it could indicate like intracranial pressure or some other type of neurological disease. So after I've checked that, I'm going to check her six cardinal fields of gaze. So I'm going to put my pen light here and just go ahead and follow it for me. And I'm just checking for strabismus or like a lazy eye, um, making sure that both eyes move with the pencil or with the pen. So hers do. So I'm, I'm done with the eyes and I'm going to go to her ears. So first inspecting wise, I would inspect the pinna and make sure that they're even with the outer campus of the ear. This is the outer campus. If it wasn't, um, a little lower might indicate Down syndrome. And then after I inspect that, I'm going to just inspect the, her general ear, especially the top. If um, for farmers or people that are out on the sun a lot, you would want to look for open wounds that haven't healed. Um, that might indicate carcinoma of the ear or a cancer of the top of the ear. Um, piercings, you just want to make sure that they aren't infected. And then the back of the ear, you'll pull back and look and see if there's any tophi, which are like white um, gouty deposits on the back of the ear. Um, and look for any like signs of redness or anything. And now I'm going to pull the top of her pinna up and back. That's what, how you examine the inside of an ear for an adult. For a child, you would pull down and back. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that, so up and back, and look at the inside. So looking at the inside, you would expect inspect for drainage, especially clear drainage, which could indicate to a cerebral spinal fluid leak, and you'd wanna test that for glucose. So I would do the same on this, year, this ear, and then after that, I would go ahead and move to her nose. So I'm inspecting the nose, making sure it looks um, symmetric on her face and she doesn't have any open cuts on the bridge of her nose. You'd want to ask them um, about your A, B, C, D, E's of that cut. Make sure there, it hasn't changed or the color hasn't changed um, or anything like that because that could indicate cancer. Now I'm going to um, test the patency of each of her nostrils by having her sniff in as I occlude one nostril. Good, and hers are both patent so she could um, breathe in um, when I included each side. So now I'm going to have her tip her head up and I'm just going to look inside her nose. I would be looking for a deviated septum or even a perforated septum, um, any swelling of the turbinates of her nose which could indicate like allergies, any um, foreign objects in the nose which is very common in kids. So I'm going to go ahead and check. Good. And you would also um, just want to look for um, proper like hair distribution in the nose. Okay, so now that I'm done with the nose, I'm going to go ahead and move on to her mouth. Um, here I could go ahead and test um, the symmetry of her face again. So like testing the facial nerve, I could have you smile. Good. And her smile is even. If the smile was one side was really drooped to the bottom, it could indicate a neurological deficiency, um, especially a stroke. You would see that a lot. Um, so now I'm going to just, you know, assess the lips, see if they're dry or cracked, which could indicate dehydration. And now after the lips, I'm going to have her open her mouth and I'm going to look in the inside. So good. I'm just looking at her throat, making sure if they have, if she has her tonsils, that they aren't swollen or closing in um, towards the midline of her mouth. I'm looking at her teeth to make sure they're all there. There's no cavities, make sure she has proper dentition. If not, I would chart poor dentition. And then I'm looking at the buccal cavities of her mouth, which can tell you a lot. Um, if there's white patches, it could be leukoplakia or red patches. Um, 
and then it could also if they're super super pale she might have some sort of like anemia going on um now i'm gonna test um, have her stick out her tongue and say ah uh. Good. That is assessing her uvula, uvula, so I'm making sure it rises midline on the back of her throat. Now I'm going to go ahead and test her gag reflex. Okay, so I'll test her gag reflex and just make sure that it's present. If not, that could be another neuroid problem. So after that, I would test the inside of her lip, especially if you have someone that chews to make sure there's no cancer there. So can you pucker your lip for me? Good, so she doesn't have any spots or anything on her lips that would indicate cancer. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and um, move on to her neck and palpate her cervical lymph nodes. And you're palpating all the way down the, the, um, your cervical lymph node chain that you have. If you felt like diffuse enlargement, it could mean they maybe had like an upper respiratory infection or some sort of inflammation going on um, that would cause the top of the head to drain into those lymph nodes. If you have found like a fixed and large painless one, it might indicate a tumor growing there. So I palpated her lymph nodes. Now I'm gonna go ahead and assess her um, thyroid as well as her trachea and make sure um, her trachea is aligned. So her tracheal alignment is good. It's in the center of her neck. Um, and now her thyroid shouldn't be palpable, which it's not, so that's good. If it was, um, you might wanna refer the patient to more testings because it could indicate a thyroid problem, such as um, like Graves' disease. So after I'm done with that, I'm gonna go ahead and move to the back. Okay, so here we are at the back, and I'm going to um, go ahead and just assess her back. You would have the patient's gown draped open, um, so you had a, have a clear view of their back. So I'm just assessing for symmetric shoulders, which hers are, um, any hunching or guarding, again, could indicate like a dislocated shoulder. Um, you would assess her spinal curvature. To get a better picture of that, I would have her hunch forward. Good. And you can see her spine is nice and straight, running right down um, the center of her back. So um, some abnormal curvatures would be scoliosis. Um, kyphosis is a lot of the time seen in older women, and that is a outward curvature of the top here. Or lordosis, which is seen in pregnant women, which is an inward cur curvature of the vertebrae down here. So after I inspect the spine, I'm going to inspect her back for maybe bruises. Bruises at different sides, um, stages of healing could indicate abuse, um, any cuts or scrapes or anything like that, um, and again, the guarding of the shoulder. So after I inspect, I'm going to go ahead and auscultate. There are eight lung fields I'm going to auscultate, and then I'm going to listen to her lateral lung fields as well. So Taylor, every time you, hear, you feel my stethoscope touch your back, just take a di big deep breath in. Good job. Now I'm going to go ahead and listen to our lateral lung fields. So do the exact same thing. Good. Good. So with the lung, he would be listening for um, making sure there was no wheezes, which could indicate air moving up, um, up the upper lobes or the upper part of her respiratory tract, moving through um, constricted airway. The bottom, um, you could maybe hear crackles indicating air mixing around with mucus, maybe they have some, some pneumonia going on. Um, just kind of make sure that their lung sounds sound nice and even. So 
Now that I listened there, I'm going to go ahead and palpate the back of her back. I'm just going to have her say 99 and assess for any um, vibration. 99. Say it one more time. 99. Good. Now she, um, if you could expect to feel just like a little bit of a vibration. So after that, I'm going to um, percuss her back and at the costal vertebral angle and assess for any kidney stones. Just let me know if you feel any pain. No. No. Good. Now I'm going to assess um, and make sure she has symmetric lung expansion. To do that, I'm just going to put my hands just like this um, on the level of the diaphragm, and she's going to take a big deep breath in, and I would expect my fingers to move apart just a little bit. So take a big deep breath in for me. Good. So hers did, so she does have symmetric lung expansion. So after... I inspect, auscultate, palpate, and then um, percuss for that those kidney stones. We um, are done with the back, and I would go ahead and move back to the front. So back at the front, I'm gonna once again examine her anterior thorax. And I would just make sure, again, that it's symmetric, her shoulders are symmetric. Um, I could even go back to the back and assess her um, shoulder strength. So I'll go ahead and do that now. This is assessing the spinal accessory nerve. So Taylor, I'm gonna put a little pressure. I just want you to shrug your shoulders up for me. So yeah, she was able to do that and it was very symmetric and even. So now um, I would inspect for any cuts or bruises or again, any sores. Um, and then after that, I would go ahead and palpate for any lumps or bumps. And she doesn't have any, so she's good. And um, then I would go ahead and start listening. There's six fields on the anterior chest that you would wanna listen in regards to the lungs. So same thing as the back, just take a big deep breath in. Good, now I'm gonna go down here on a female. Good. Good, on a male patient, you would just be able to kind of go back down, but because it's a female with the breast tissue, that muffled lung sounds a lot, so you'd want to move underneath the breast. So now that I did lung sounds and everything on the front, I'm going to go ahead and have her lay down. All right, so here, And make sure she's in B. Okay. So from here, I'm gonna go ahead and um, assess her abdomen. So with the abdomen, what, inspecting wise, what you want to look for is hernias. Um, any again, bruising at different stages of healing to indicate abuse. Any um, other kind of lacerations, you could ins uh, see a protuberant abdomen, which could um, indicate ascites. A scaphoid one, which is the in or just like a flat abdomen um, and skin skinny people sometimes you can see the aortic pulsation um, of the descending aorta there um, so after inspection you would want to auscultate first so I'm gonna listen in all four quadrants of the stomach and you would start over here at the ileocecal valve which is where the junction of the small intestine and large intestine is and after that you would follow the colon so I'm gonna go ahead and do that now Now, I did hear bowel sounds, but if you didn't, you um, would want to listen on each quadrant for a um, total of five minutes each. Um, 
some bowel sounds you could have. One is called Bored Bogdimus, and it's just like a whole bunch of bowel sounds happening. Um, so now that I've listened, you can go ahead and palpate. So you're doing light palpation, which is just an inch first. So I would go ahead and palpate just half an inch. And then you can do deep palpation, which is an inch. Um, you want to make sure that the spleen isn't palpable um, and then assess for any tenderness or anything like that. Um, percussion, you would just percuss um, for, you would have dull sounds over solid objects and then timpani over um, ones that are hollow. So now that I'm done with her abdomen, I'm going to go ahead and move to her extremities. So inspecting wise, I would just want to make sure that she has even hair distribution everywhere. If not, like if this arm didn't have hair, she might have like a um, vascular problem in that arm. Um, the same with the legs or the other arm. Um, I would also be assessing for the same height of her extremities. And then after I assess, I'm going to go ahead and test her muscle strength. So squeeze both of my hands for me. Now she did that great. Um, both the strength on both of her arms was the exact same. So that's what you want to see. Make sure she has equal muscle strength on both sides. If not, that can indicate um, a stroke as well. Now I'm going to do the same on her legs. So go ahead and push up with my hands. Good. Now push down. Good. So now that I did that, I'm going to go ahead and test her um, a couple things over here on her fingernails. So first I would test her capillary refill. Make sure the color comes back in less than three seconds. That indicates good blood flow and circulation. If not, she might have poor blood flow. Um, I would also assess for clubbing, which is an angle of 160 or greater. Basically the nail just flattens out and it starts clubbing. And that could indicate long-term like respiratory diseases such as COPD or any disease that is long-term oxygen deficiency. And then I would assess for skin turgor and her skin bounces back in less than three seconds, which is great. That um, means that she's adequately hydrated. If the patient's very dehydrated, it might not bounce back and it might take more seconds than three. So that's what you're looking for there. So after the extremities, I would go ahead and start my cardiovascular assessment. To start with that, you would want to check all the pulses first. So for every pulse except the carotid, you're going to um, palpate them at the same time to make sure that they're equal. So I'd start with the temporal and I would go down to the carotid. Good. Notice I was doing each side separately and I would do the brachial pulses. Good. And then her radial. Good job. And then I would go down to the femoral, right here. Good job. And then the popliteal. Good. And then sh the dorsalis pedis, or sorry, the <laughs> posterior um, tibialis down here. And then the dorsalis pedis on top of the foot. Good. So if the pulses weren't even, you would want to um, go back and compare those with the apical pulse. And so we're going to go ahead and start auscultating now. So I'm going to listen to six different points um, on her chest to listen to her heart. So I'm going to start over here with the aortic. Good. And then pulmonic. Good job. Herbs point. And then mitral, sorry, tricuspid. And then mitral's down here. And then you would listen in the epigastric region for um, any sort of aneurysm. So first with the diaphragm, and then I'm going to switch it over to the bell. And if she, she sounds okay, but if the patient did have an aneurysm, um, you would hear like a really, really strong whooshing sound. So the apical pulse is right here. 
and this is what you would listen to for one full minute and then if any of your other pulses were uneven you would compare them with the apical pulse so after that um with the heart sounds you could be listening for a plural friction rub which would sound like a grating sound um indicating like the heart and the plural surface or that kind of two surfaces are rubbing together you could listen for murmurs um, murmurs would indicate a uh, regurgitation of blood through a valve and um, any other um, normal sounds that you might hear um, after the heart I would go ahead and do a breast exam on her so I'm not going to do it with her but I will talk about it so you would want to look at the breast, have the patient sitting in front of you, and just examine them first. Make sure they're symmetric or that they don't have a sick breast and one's hanging really lower than the other one. Um, you would also want the woman to lean forward and you would check for dimpling, which could indicate a tumor that's growing there or um, just like an orange peel appearance. Um, you could also palpate. You would palpate in a circular motion, walking your fingers or you can palpate up and down um, but again just walk your fingers and you would definitely want to palpate in the upper outer quadrant and then feel um, the axillary area and then the um, lymph nodes there for any enlargement or lumps or bumps again after that I would in, um, inspect the nipple for discharge there shouldn't be any unless she's lactating um, that's a if she is if there is discharge and she's not lactating that's a red flag for cancer and then after that, I would instruct her on a, her monthly um, breast self exam, which she should do um, after her um, menstrual cycle. If you have a um, postmenopausal woman, you would have them pick a day and do it the same day each month. So after the breast exam, I would do the um, genital urinary exam and I would position the female in dorsal recumbent position and you would just be looking and looking to make sure you know that she doesn't have any um, abnormal drainage or discharge um, green and frothy could indicate trick or yellow and like really odorous could indicate a bacterial infection make sure that they don't have any foreign objects in there and that she has even hair distribution um, and then you could also you want to assess the um, Bartharin glands um, if they have pain while you're palpating the edges um, of her uh, labias, they, she might have a blocked Bartharin gland. Um, so on a male, you would want to um, just assess again, even hair distribution, and then assess the penis, make sure if, if, if the man's uncircumcised that you retract it, and make sure that there's no discharge underneath there, and always um, put it back, and then make sure that the urethral meatus is centrally located um, on the tip of the penis and if it could be hypospadias or epispadias if it was above or below. And then you would want to palpate the testes and make sure they're both there. If they're not, um, just ask the patient if they were born without one or because um, they might know that information. Um, after that, you could palpate the inguinal canal of the man and make sure they don't have any hernias or bulges there. Um, after the genital urinary exam, you would put the patient in the SIMS position and inspect the rectum and anus. So you'll just be inspecting again for even hair distribution, um, any hemorrhoids, lacerations, or like self-inflicted scratches. A lot of the times our older dementia patients will just scratch a lot, causing those uh, lacerations down there. Um, as it says for again, foreign objects. Um, and then for patency, you would want to assess that as well. Um, properly lube your fingers before you start palpating around there. And you can also um, inspect like the rectal wall and make sure it is intact. So after I'm done, I would go ahead and give my patient some wipes to clean up. And then I would have them sit back up, present to them my findings, ask them if they had any questions, and then I would take my gloves off and then thoroughly document what I found in the head to toe exam. I would also be assessing um, the patient's emotional status through the exam, um, as well as like muscul musculoskeletal movements and um, just like their skin everywhere. So, yep. And again, document, document, document.